Well, I'll tell you one thing. I put my career on the line for this. They can take my badge and take my gun and call me a loose cannon. But if I have to break down every law in the books, then damn it, I'm going to do it because I'm doing this podcast because this is beyond the scenes, damn it. This is where we dig into your favorite segments from The Daily Show and we don't stop until we solve them no matter what the cost. And if you haven't guessed by now, we're talking about police and how they're portrayed on TV shows. It's called Copaganda. It's a piece we did about cop shows that have dominated TV for decades and how the portrayal of policing affects our understandings of law enforcement in the real world. Roll the tape. Police dramas are iconic, hugely popular, and now under intense fire from activists who say these shows far too readily portray cops as good and trustworthy I never put a hand on. while undermining real-life claims of systemic racism and abuse. Police not only consult on these shows, but they're also very aware that their portrayals impact public perception, and they have a vested interest in making sure that portrayal is positive. Yes, believe it or not, watching cop shows makes a lot of people see the police as infallible. And honestly, I don't blame any of these people. I mean, I'll admit, a lot of my perceptions about reality have been shaped by TV as well. Part of the reason it's easy for TV shows to convince people that cops are always right and always good at their jobs is because that's what we want to believe. I think we can all agree that we want people who are gonna enforce laws fairly and effectively so that we don't have to do it ourselves. I know I don't wanna do it. Now, to talk a little bit more about this topic, we're gonna talk with the people that helped make this piece come together. Two hard-nosed detectives who brought this piece to life and they live for the Daily Show badge that's on their chest. They both own Blue Bloods on VHS and DVD because they're diehards. Uh, One of our deep dive producers, Madeline Coons, hello to you. Hello, hello. And one of our writers, Ashton Womack, Ashton, how you doing? Ashton, I heard that you own the whole box set of Law and Order LA. Yes, I do. Only to learn what not to do uh, and how to avoid the cops. That's what I study. (laughs) (laughs) So for the people who missed this segment, could you all, uh, I'll start with you, Madeline. Uh, Tell me what this segment is all about. The segment's called Copaganda. And a lot of that is just like, it's looking at like just the prevalence of cop shows. I think if you think of, I mean, one is like the most watched genre of like all TV, like it's the most popular genre of like all TV shows, which is crazy. Um, and just like the the absolute prevalence of that on TV and like how that actually influences our opinions in real life about law enforcement. Because as we mentioned in the piece, like just like, like most Americans really have such little interactions with police. You know, I think it's like 20% of like all Americans. So like we really don't, see the police that often. And yet we have this like deep familiarity with like law enforcement and like the policing system in a way that doesn't quite make sense unless you take into account like the hours and hours of TV watched and like the media that we consume. That statistic you just said was crazy. Yeah. 20% of all Americans. 20%. Only, yeah, only meanwhile, 20%. 100% of all black people have definitely dealt with the cops. So it's like, <laughs> and we're only like 13% of the country. I know. Yeah. That's like, seven <laughs> percent. Who's these other seven? Who's yeah. the seven? <laughs> They're like, where are you? Step forward. Name what yourself. Lucky like... individual. Uh, Ashton, did copaganda work on you growing up in the sense of you see these shows where, you know, essentially the police are always right. They do whatever it takes to get the suspect. And you, the viewer, understand I had to break that rule. Otherwise, that bad guy would have gotten away with the thing. How much did television influence your views and opinions of the police uh it never influenced my opinions of the police because i had actual experience with the police so when you you can show me something on tv all day but if i go outside and experience a whole different reality i'm just disconnected i don't believe what you're showing me so i always grew up that's why like you said earlier it was a joke but i genuinely did not watch like my mom watched nypd uh new york undercover that was like probably the one show uh, yeah, that's the one they got black people. We watched yeah. that one. <laughs> I don't want to age myself, but yeah, I'm in ballpark your mama's age. And yeah, no, it was Malik Yoba, man. Yeah, Come Malik. On, yeah. I, him the and, the, and like, wasn't the Puerto Rican guy? I forgot. I forgot but. In the last act of every episode, they would play music and it would be a live artist. I'm so glad you chose me. So you got the 
to see black music and culture, but we also took them down and yeah, put and them into a system that ain't going to treat them right fairly when they get in front of a judge. That was my experience with watching TV uh, or watching cops on the TV. I, I would watch cops and obviously root for the people running. I'm like, come on, dog. Jump that gate. Jump the gate. Make it. And th- that was so my you experience. watch cop shows to root for the criminal. Yeah. Yes. Someone's got exactly. to. Someone's got to be on like, their side. I've had, you know, my own experiences. You know, I've, I've mm-hmm. said this, you know, I haven't said this often in life, but I've had a gun pulled on me five times. Four of them were police officers. Jesus. To the point where if just a regular dude on the street pulled a gun on me, I like them odds better. You almost would be like, show me your badge. Well, in a in a in a weird way, because you know there are certain cops that are gonna follow the rules, and they the training worked fine. But the likelihood of me running into a cop that is nervous is higher than me running into a dude off the corner mm-hmm. who's nervous. Mm-hmm. Because if you just a regular ass dude, robbing somebody is one of the boldest things. That you've already decided that nothing can happen to you. So within that boldness, oddly, I believe, is some level of decorum. You, you mean, know, like there's honor amongst thieves, but not amongst cops, apparently. Like that, that's I'm just saying, if you told me a gun was going to get pulled on me tomorrow and I got to choose random dude on subway track or police officer, mm-hmm. I would choose random dude on subway track. And that's a huge testament to policing in America, especially for, for black people. That's crazy that you feel that way. You should be calling. You should be calling the cops on the guy. But instead, you have to. If you call the cops, they gonna come and pull the gun on you. They gonna think the robber is still in the. He's still here. And then, like, it's, <laughs> and you bring up honestly, like, Roy, you bring up a really good point about being like the nervousness of police because I do think like a huge theme and like cop, like cop shows and procedurals is showing like how cops are not only like superhuman, but like they're making these split second decisions like with a very cool head and almost like moving in a way that's very confident on screen. And so people kind of use that and transpose that I think when they think of cops in real life, like they don't understand that there is like someone who is being nervous and not, you know, like it it kind of, it pushes that idea that like the decision that the cops are making is always right on TV because they're not hesitating. The the one thing that I've always found ridiculous in any police show or any police movie is when they commandeer a regular person's vehicle to yeah. keep the car chase going. <laughs> like the robber takes a motorcycle and then the cop, just, like Bad Boys yeah. 2 is the best example yeah. where the, Dan <laughs> Marino was, was on the test drive and they snatched Dan Marino out the car. It's like, come on, you wouldn't do that. Stop the car. Get, get, yeah. Police, pop the trunk. Get out, get in. I am in the middle of a sale. Do I have to pull my gun? Oh, shit, Dan Marino, what's up, man? Back up, Dan. Hey, you're the truth. Whatever you need, officers. Hey, Marcus, that's Dan Marino. Hey! Back up. Let me know how it rides. Oh, he's gonna test drive the shit out this. And it's always, like, dramatic. They're, like, holding, like, some groceries, and they're like, what? And then they throw up some, like, orange. <laughs> it's, the, it's the flashing of the badge or not. They're just like, I'm police! And they, you know, like, they're just like, who is, this, who is this random dude? I'll say this. The the conversation around propaganda almost ruined Bad Boys Three for me. I'm glad I got that one yeah. in just Before. under the wire. <laughs> that came out January, the same year of George Floyd, mm-hmm. and like I was like, "Whoo!" I'm glad I got my trilogy. Yeah. Now yeah. I can <laughs> stop watching them types of movies. What you can, you can retire now. Yeah, <laughs> we waited, Roy. Right. We wanna... we like we're not going to do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> what made you all want to talk about this piece? Like, just walk me through the the genesis of this conversation in the building. Did this start in the writer's wing, Ashton, or did this start over in research in the producer wing mm-hmm. with you, Madeline? Um, so before, so I'm in a like a smaller department called we're called like the deep dive department. So we, you know, we do a lot of like looking into. Uh, a lot of like non-headline issues. Um, Ashton is our very successful alumnus. So last year, back when he was in Deep Dive, uh, this was about, it was like the end of June, uh, like the last week of June is like when this aired. So a few weeks before that, when we were talking about just the rise of like the Black Lives Matter protests that were springing up like across the country and the world um, after George Floyd was murdered. It was watching over and over again, you know, both just watching the news, but also, you know, for work, just watching the overwhelmingly peaceful protests and then seeing the the police brutality that was like being brought into that peaceful space. 
Um, and just seeing those images over and over again and the videos of people who are very young, you know, but almost always black. Um, and, and Ashton can talk more about this, uh, but, you know, what, one thing that I think got me started to think about this issue was just, um, or this piece was more just because, you know, Ashton was protesting and the way that he was beaten by police officers and like seeing that happen so close to home in a way, you know, made me really, it got me thinking a lot of just, again, as one of the, not one of the 21% of Americans who've ever really had uh, run-ins or police encounters and just how looking at what was in front of me and how unmemorable the few in police, like police encounters I've had in real life are that I just don't remember, do, like I don't remember them that much because they're not, they're not consequential in that way. So it was really trying to like get to the bottom of that. Let's stay with that for a second, Ashton. Madeline says she can't even remember most of her encounters with the police. Walk me through some of yours. Uh, I don't even know where, where to start. Uh, I mean, even as like growing up and you grew up in a black neighborhood, it's just ingrained in you. I can't even remember the time when I ever thought like police were heroes or, or good. It's always been a negative interaction with my community to the point where like you play cops and robbers. Don't nobody want to be the cops. Everybody's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a robber. Hey, well, you got it's No one you saw when you see someone coming in and harassing your community, you don't, you don't see them as the good guys. I remember I've had plenty of interactions when I was younger in Texas, I got arrested for weed twice. When I was a teenager, everybody, you know, obviously it's proven black, brown, white kids are, kids are doing smoking weed at the same exact, uh, rate. There's no, there's no race doing, doing it more yet. I would hear these insane stories about how my friends would get pulled over and the cops would be like, Oh, you're good. Oh, you're good. But if they just smelled anything around us, we were going to jail. We had to deal with it. We would go, with, we were in probation. We had to deal with getting put into the cycle that keeps people in jail, especially black people telling, Not going, employed. yeah, exactly. You get put in a situation just because of the color of your skin to be in a cycle of uh, the carceral system. You have to, you go to probation. They say you need to find a job and pay these and, and pay these fees or you're going pay back to jail. Fines. Well, if I don't have no job <laughs> and I can't, I can't, pay if i can't pay i'm going to jail i've had a lot of interactions with the police with the carceral system it's kind of designed for me to have those interactions it's, it's clear as day that i was dealing with a racist system and so were all my friends around you and it's not until hearing stories like madeline's that it's like oh you really had a different experience dealing with the police it's like that made up a large part of my teenage youth and stress and my mom being disappointed in me and me thinking it plays a, it has plays deeper effects on you because you don't think you're going to be able to succeed in life. You feel like you're, you've been thrown away. And that was, that's, that's, I'm sure I'm not the only person who feels that. When we come back to beyond the scenes, we're going to talk a lot more about copaganda. And I know both of y'all got a favorite cop show. So don't even sit here in front. Like you don't start thinking now. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm going to ask only one. Okay. Yeah. Don't lie. <laughs> you, you uh, no, I'm like, you're asking us to name only one. I was like, how can we, how can we choose? The one that I love, I consider one of the best television series of all time. And I'm so ashamed when I tell y'all the premise of the show, Ashton's going to be furious. We'll be right back. Oh, God. <laughs> Madeline, I'm going to start with you. We're talking about copaganda. Copaganda, which is the deliberate or unintentional portrayal of police in a positive light to thus make law enforcement look very agreeable and as if our criminal justice system is working for everyone when we know that it isn't. But even when we know that, I still think we all have guilty pleasures. There's foods that you're not supposed to eat that you eat, you know they're bad for you. So we all know there's TV shows that are kind of bad for your mind that you still sometimes check out. Madeline, what is your favorite cop show of all time? I mean, I will say the one that um, it's not one of the typical procedurals in terms of like cops, but criminal minds, which is all about like the FBI, like profiling serial killers. It follows like the same exact formula and the template. And like, I don't know, it was on all the time when um, I was in grad school. I was in Ireland and like the only TV sh channel that we got was this like criminal criminal minds like during the break. And I was like, well, this is what I'm watching. Like, <laughs> and I just got so addicted to that show. But 
it was also really crazy. I was just like, oh, wow, we're exporting like the way that we see law enforcement and policing to like the rest of the world. Um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, no, I watched like all of it and it's not good, but it's <laughs> hugely problematic. Ashton, I already know your answer. You watched New York Undercover, but that's only because Malik Yoba was in it and Ice T. Um, I grew up watching T.J. Hooker. He was in syndication by that point. William Shatner just is a tough L.A. detective, always in a foot chase with action music playing and all of that. 90s, early aughts, uh, New York Undercover, and then Third Watch was a show that I loved. It wasn't extremely popular, but I thought it was well done. But my GOAT TV show, I have I have four TV shows that I think are just canon in this television universe. The Wire, The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, and The Shield. Oh, oh. oh. okay, yeah, we definitely watched now, some of that. <laughs> it got violent there at the end. Yeah. Uh, now, <laughs> when we talk propaganda, the oh, shield. Well. The, and, and this is going to dovetail into my question about your you all's research into researching this 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 segment. But the shield for those who never saw it, it was a show about a dirty cop unit. It was based on the Rampart unit in LAPD that was just running roughshod over people in the nineties. But in the show, there were a dirty unit. But they sometimes do the wrong thing for the right. Re I'm a dirty cop and I steal, but I steal to pay for the private school for my autistic child. See? What? See? Yeah. What? You what? like me, right? No, I hate you. <laughs> there was a cop that was investigating the unit. And this is the pilot of The Shield. I'm not even giving away the series. The first episode, there's a clean cop investigating the dirty cops and they kill him. And the rest of the series is the lengths that they go to cover up that crime. Oh, wow. This kind of sounds good. It's one of the best television shows ever written. But. I mean, it was a big rise of like the anti-hero. That's like, he was like. Vic Mackey and Tony Soprano it. were yeah. the only two that existed. Those are the mm -hmm. only two characters that existed where I should hate you, but you do good things. Because he would also do dirty stuff and solve the crime of the week. Mm -hmm. But he would break all of the rules to, oh, my daughter's been kidnapped and it was a Colombian. So then he would go into the hood and chop off eight Colombians. On, my bad, that was the wrong Colombian. Anyway, we found <laughs> yeah. the girl. But we found her in the, yeah, it's very like ends justify means 100%. I bring all of that up to ask you all, in the process of researching this, what were some of the common themes that you saw through all of this in terms of the programming? There's like three on the top of my head that come to mind and like, uh the first one well the first one was that like all these like all these cop shows just like how many there are and like just like the format of the procedural of like solving a crime every week it really makes it seem like violent crime is like increasing or like this like reality that we live in where in fact like violent crime has been like trending downward over time so it's just like but this idea of just like seeing crime all the time makes us like deeply fearful and makes like having a police force necessary mm -hmm. um which i you know is not the way that you need to view the police force, especially if you're looking at like funding issues and things like that. The second one was more like, like this like weird, like colorblind magical world where there's like a lot of black and brown people in roles and like judges and like other police officers. So it's like, there's race, but racism doesn't exist. So it's just like, you're like, oh, so that's okay that he's chasing that guy. Cause it's not about a systemic problem. Or like if they do deal with race, it's like, a very special episode and it's all about like one black cop. Do you know what I mean? He's like, he was mean to me and it's like, must be hard for you, you know? And, and then yeah. it's just like, oh, but it's, it's like not a- It's The Wire like, season four. Yeah, yeah, it's like the whole, yeah, exactly. You're like, it's that yeah, one they, guy, not a system. It's okay, we're moving on and we're never gonna mention this again. Just like this idea of like, I, got, I did what I had to do, you know? Like this idea that like the way that we, have normalized ab like the abuse, like the intimidation, the like boatloads of like illegal surveillance that these shows do. And just like we normalize that feeling. And so it's excused and justified. And we think like the cops have to do it to be good. And so because the police are the good guys that like, it's almost just like even when they're bad, like the system only works because they the police break the rules. Like that's the only way the justice yeah. system works. We can't just break protocol because we think it's right at the time and expect to get away with it. Normally I'd agree with you. 
But in this case, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. Well, as you well know, we will need a warrant to search the house. Agent Callan, these are exigent circumstances. You let me worry about the legal ramifications. If I gotta bend the rules a little bit to get a bad guy off the street, I'm gonna do it, and you would too. Forget warrants, forget the rules. It's on us to catch him. Ooh, that was cool. Although what that guy was actually saying is the constitution is for pussies. I guess the things that stuck out to me as well was like what they didn't show. It was like it was mm -hmm. like the same. The people who wrote these TV shows were the same people who wrote uh, Florida's critical race theory laws. They're like, we're taking all the black stuff out. You, know, you just we, yeah. you don't even pay attention to black stuff. And it's like that's what I paid attention to. Having a, a cops that are just trying to trying to make them lovable when. I just never saw a lovable cop. And I was like, who are these? Who are these down to earth, hu humane cops? That I, and why am I not getting any of them? That that was that was what I noticed the most. And like like Mads was saying, it was how they portray these cops as these like just anti heroes. And and what kind of really did stick out was like seeing them br br break the law, even in the, their own system. Like they couldn't say like like I was saying say if they needed something out of evidence locker they would break the law in the police department they would they didn't follow the law anywhere they'd be like uh let me i need something out of here out of the evidence locker and they'd be like sorry i'm not allowed to and then they smash their head up against the evidence locker and then they the evidence locker opens up and they're like guess i didn't need you anyway and it's like they would just break laws your head. Like <laughs> yeah it's like you broke the law in the department and it's like to me, what it was upsetting to me because it's like, well, it's you're normalizing this behavior and you're allowing you're we were, we were basically giving sanction to for officers to be that violent and that like aggressive even all, throughout the entire time. I'm so sorry I pitched the session because we had to watch so much like we had to watch so many episodes like God, yeah we we watched we watched a lot of TV. It was brutal. A lot of TV. Dun -dun. A lot of it was super bad. Um, there was just like some crazy, crazy epi like crazy episodes that I was like how there was a blue buds episode where a cop like literally he chases a sus you know a suspect who is black into an apartment building like pulls out his gun and is like stop free you know freeze or whatever the guy on the second floor throws himself out of the window lands on the ground and then he like breaks his arm so he's like police brutality police brutality and I was like this is not but police it was like a three minute long you yeah. know scene so like you can't we couldn't use it yeah. but i was just like who sees this and thinks that's what police brutality police brutality is. wait wait don't shoot shut your mouth hey back inside the apartment turn around put your hands against the wall i promise i'll throw you out that window <laughs> Give me some examples of stuff that you wish it made it into the piece but didn't because of time. The kids piece, the kids portion. Mm, mm -hmm. What's that? The propaganda that gets shown to children uh, and, you know, slowly indoctrinates them into believing uh, that, you know, everything is good with the uh, policing in America and getting them to, which I mean, you don't want to like, which is, it, it is a fine line to walk. You don't want to introduce uh, negative thoughts around uh, policing, but you do want to be honest to your kids about what policing in America is currently. And so, but we had a vast, uh, just vast PR system targeted towards children for police, Paw Patrol, uh, which I think is the most insidious one because uh, it's like cops are, I mean, car, uh, dogs are definitely racist. And then now they're cops. There's doubly racist. <laughs> <What? laughs> Like, yeah. dogs. Not, not, what dogs wow. don't see colors right. they don't wow, even... Ashton. wow have you met the paw patrol because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> i've met them i don't know the paw patrol live pre-covid i don't know man dogs don't see color and i don't trust that i'm like bro you should I see, see my if color. all of the paw patrol was german shepherds and you as a black person <laughs> would feel some sort of way based on the german shepherd's relationship with the black community in the 60s but i'm not gonna let you blanket all do not all dogs what no. a, what about reality tv where does reality mm -hmm. television fit into playing a role there was a television show that used to come on true tv in the early aughts this is when reality tv was really wild the show was called bait car Mm. and 
bait car was a show where they would have a nice car and leave the engine running and just leave it in a low income Mm -hmm. neighborhood. I love that show. And then some random dumbass would hop in the car. Ooh, the key's in it. Hell yeah. 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 And they would hop in it and then the kill switch would be activated. Mm -hmm. They would be locked in the car and then the cops would pull up and take them to jail for car theft. Okay, these guys are right up on the car now. They're in the car. Driver's getting in. Stand by. <laughs> Big car heading north. Okay, shut it The kill switch stalls the engine and locks up the windows and doors. Right here. Oh! Is it? The order! Ivan. Ivan. Ah, it's too late, dog. We're going to jail, dog. It's like the police were creating mm-hmm. scenarios for entrapment. crime instead of yeah. going to find crime. Like a show like that, and I'll be honest, you're right, it was entertaining, Ashton. <laughs> it was. Because the funny in it was watching people trying mm-hmm. to figure Struggle. out how to get out the car. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, uh, the, and you, and like for me, when I would watch uh, Bait Car, I would always, I know what the outcome is going to be. I know every single time they go into jail. Yeah. But I still would be like, come on, brother. It's like rooting for the Washington Generals versus uh, the Harlem Globetrotters. You know they go lose, but she, I mean, you they get, they got one fan in me. Like, uh, yeah, it just never really hit until mm-hmm. you know, you know, a year or two later, where you just like, you knew like, well, should the police be doing this anyway? It's entertaining. Then years yeah. later, you go, wait, like that's really messed that's up. Messed yeah, up. <laughs> Reality TV is almost like its own, you know, own piece in itself because it's just so expansive Mm -hmm. um so we really didn't have time to fit that into the piece but like um we did we did look into a lot of reality tv and it's Mm -hmm. deeply disturbing to watch and it's also just um i learned a lot more about the show cops though which yeah uh, i think everyone watched whether they realized it or not it was on everywhere it wasn't all bad man it's like sometimes i got to watch some of my favorite clips from yeah, I got to watch some of my favorite clips from cops. There was one clip on there I remember watching. It was like the this like one this one lady. She went to a cop and she was like, "This lady, this drug dealer. I was trying to buy drugs and she ain't selling me the drugs." And then the cop was like, "What? Uh, show me who." <laughs> and then she went to the lady and she was like, "Ma'am, did you not sell her drugs?" And she was like, first off, officer, I'm not a drug dealer. I'm a prostitute. I don't sell crack. I'm a prostitute." And then we were like, "Well, what?" <laughs> What is that? So there's classic clips. Don't get it wrong. Oh, cops got some, you know, good good stuff. There's but also it's a yeah, terrible <laughs> show. It's a terrible show. What I didn't know actually before doing this piece was just like the history behind cops and how it was really used as this like PR vehicle. Mm-hmm. So it started to like get big after it was like a year or two after the um the police beating of Rodney King. It's like mm-hmm. the co- the show Cops was invited by um they got permission to film in LA. Mm-hmm. And it was specifically to rehab the image of mm-hmm. the LAPD to make them like give he- like receive better coverage, and like mm-hmm. that became the cops' models. They know what they're doing; they're rehabbing their image. Like when Justin mm-hmm. Bieber did the just, roast to Justin Bieber, it's like, oh, this is to rehab his image. That's literally yeah, cops <laughs> that's cops. Yeah, the, the roast <laughs> of the San Diego Police Department. <laughs> cops did get taken off the air during the George Floyd um, uprising in this country. At least no new episodes. I've heard rumors that it's starting to seep back into syndication in certain places. But uh, I want after the break, I want to talk to you all about the future of propaganda and where we go from here now that we as a country are actually aware of what the hell is going on. Also, we need to talk about why all these rappers end up being cops at some point. <laughs> LL Cool J, a cop on mm-hmm. NCIS. Ice T is a cop. Um, the Ice Cube is a cop in Ride Along. We need to talk about that transition from F the police to, <laughs> to how much you gonna pay me an episode? Can, to I, can I apply to the police? <laughs> <laughs> this is beyond the scenes. We'll be right back. I want to talk about where can we go from here in changing public perceptions through entertainment? Because I'm gonna be honest, I have two cops in my family: Chicago suburbs and a Mississippi State trooper. A lot of cop work is mundane. It's weird. It's it's talking to a prostitute who supposedly sold me drugs, but she's not even a drug dealer. It's that type of stuff. <laughs> a television show's job is to tell a story, to wrap you up in a story with drama and conflict. 
So you need conflict if you want a show to be good. If you're telling the truth about policing, it's probably going to be boring. You need some... Dr- i give you a perfect example, Ashton. The Shield, season five. Anthony Anderson was the villain. He had killed a girl and hid the body. And they spent the whole season trying to find the body of this girl. Vic Mackey finds out that Anthony Anderson's son is in prison in a minimum security jail. So Vic Mackey has his son transferred to maximum security where all of Anthony Anderson's street gang enemies are incarcerated, knowing what they'll do to his son. And Vic Mackey used the threat of prison rape and traumatizing a 19 year old to find the body of the dead girl and bring the family justice. Can can we all vote right now for the Shield dramatization podcast just by Broy? <laughs> <laughs> I would listen to that. <laughs> was you not enthralled by that, that storyline? Yeah, I'm. Li- yeah, I'm li- that's I'm how you li- get leverage on a yeah. criminal. I, who I don't even want to watch the story. Black yeah. women. Yeah. <laughs> but like I, it, I know that that's not realistic. But are there any show like? Because to me, there are aspects of police work that I don't know anything about, and that I do to a degree help inform me. I will say that Law and Order SVU by and large was a great part of my education on just how terrible a gender men are. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a show, it, it's not an easy show to watch even with Ice-T with his perm. I feel like that's why they have Ice-T in that show is to make it more digestible for, for black people. Cause you know, <laughs> it's so serious and heavy. And then Ice-T just walks in the room. Man, he did it, man. We got to take him down. Whoa, is that a body over there? He's like, yeah, that's a body. <laughs> that's a body over there, Ice-T. <laughs> <Just crazy. laughs> yeah, no. Uh, 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 I, well, 100%, that is like one of the things that we, we were running into, not running into, but we, were, we discovered is, and we kind of already knew, is that a lot of what they show is violence. They over-sensationalize sensationalize the violence aspect of police work and they minimize the actual police, the work of the police work, which when you, you hear at these protests, you hear about it all the time. You hear that like the police are overworked. They have too many jobs. There should be mental health counselors going out for certain, uh, to deal with certain problems instead of sending a police officer. That's why, you know, a large percentage of police shootings end up being, a disabled mentally disabled or handicapped people because they just they only know how to some not they only know how but they're dealing with problems that shouldn't you need a hammer you probably should give to other people but th- it's it is an over sensationalization over sensationalization of police violence and but, i think you definitely got to start there madeline do these shows have a responsibility to be socially conscious or to just be entertaining I mean, I think there's there's a a space between there where it's like if you're going to try to push like a realistic genre, like policing doesn't exist in a vacuum in our society. It has like very real implications. Um, I mean, I will say watching SVU, which is a show that I loved and I loved Olivia Benson. It did make me feel like I would be kidnapped at any time, anywhere in the city, uh, because that's what happens at the beginning of the episode. Um, of like every episode is like this woman has kid- been kidnapped. They will find they will beat up the suspect until they get her location and they will save her just in time. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the thing one of the reports that really helped this piece was uh, Color of Change did this like massive study of co- like police procedurals uh, and they, they released this like really large report. It was called like Normalizing Injustice. And one of the stats they found, um, which I think Ashton, you can talk more about this being a black writer you know, in often a very white space, but 81% of the writers on these scripted TV shows are, are white. So you're, you don't have mm. the demographics reflecting the reality. So, I mean, maybe it's less of a, an outright responsibility, but like if they're gonna try to tell stories, it's like you don't have enough voices in the room to actually tell that story. In, to tell it balanced and mm-hmm. tell it properly, yeah. So yeah, I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these, uh, a lot of these storylines. Well, I, know, I know Viacom CBS, who's a proud parent company of The Daily Show and the Beyond the Scenes podcast, Viacom, CBS, and other networks, they've hired, you know, a lot of consulting groups to police their portrayal of people and the criminal justice system in their program. And it's almost like they've, like, companies have had to hire, like, it's not enough to just 
cancel cops and say you're not mm-hmm. going to show cops anymore but now you need someone to come in and audit your whole situation to find where your racial blind spots are mm-hmm. and it's you know you know all love the paramount but it's crazy that you have to do that when you can just hire people of color or people who've experienced those things you wouldn't need a consulting group if you you know had if we if this country's done the right thing and put people and, and allowed people to tell their own stories I'd say just especially like if no harm was coming of this, like maybe they don't have a social responsibility, but like we've already we've seen that these shows are like actively shaping our perceptions of police, right? In a way that doesn't match reality and that might be deeply harmful for certain people in society um, who have a lot less power. So yeah, I think there is, I think something has to change um, and it has to change just as much behind the camera as in front of it. So I think one of the things we did learn while researching this was how we probably said it already, but how these shows literally, they created the perspective of, of kind of black people in policing and why it was okay to be overly brutal to black people in America, because they're watching these police shows and the criminals though, though there was this notion of having like the, the the cop shows would have black police chiefs and all that. You would still have the criminals uh, be uh, over overwhelmingly black or POCs. And it, kind of justified in America's mind the brutality and that it needs to happen. And that is like that that is the problem. When someone else has control over your image, they they have the control over my image. They can do with it what they will and they put that image in other people's minds. And now I have to deal with the consequences of what they've put in pe- people's minds. I actually Madeline, had qu- excuse me. Oh, oh go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, man. I just I had a question for you because you mentioned that you had police officers in your family and I'm wondering how they're affected by watching cop shows and like how if that changed your perception of watching cop shows because I didn't I mean I don't have any law enforcement in my family so Mm -hmm. it really was like being raised by Olivia Benson you know talking to them taught me the mundaneness Mm -hmm. the the overwhelming mundaneness of police work which I think feeds into the when something oh you got some action Mm-hmm. It feeds into that. Oh shit, y'all was shopping. This is mm-hmm. everything that I've been trained to stop because mm-hmm. this is the one thing that I should always be careful about. Like when I saw Bad Boys Two, the thing that's always made me laugh about police work in general on television is after they shoot somebody and then they just go on about the rest of the case. Like you're mm-hmm. supposed to get mm-hmm. pulled off and take fourteen days and go see the psych oh, psychiatrist. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. you're supposed to go do all like Bad Boys Two. They blew up the whole freeway. <laughs> And there was no paperwork. They, They're just like, great. There was no paperwork. Good job, boys. Keep it the you, case. You destroyed Cuba. $16 billion worth of city damage. And God damn it, you do it again. And like yeah. they get comp- a pat on the back. They're like, <laughs> they went to Cuba without clearance from the government to save <laughs> Will Smith's girlfriend. <laughs> and blew up a mansion in <laughs> Cuba. So... They Bad Boys Three should have just been them coming back from suspension for the last fifteen years. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a black question for you, uh, Madeline. Just sit this one down. And me and Ashton, don't I was talk like, please don't say me. Please don't say me. <laughs> I thought he was gonna say you. <laughs> Denzel's Oscar and Training Day proud moment or no? As a dirty cop. I mean, obviously, I think it's very nuanced, proud moment, because wasn't it like one of the first times a black uh, actor was able to get uh, be awarded at that at that height? But it had to. Yeah. yeah, But it had to be for being a crooked, dirty cop. I I mean, they could have gave that to Carl Winslow. He you know, he should have been. If we're why you got why we got to start with the dirty cop. Carl Winslow was a great cop and he taught America uh good values and he didn't get awarded at all. So I, I don't have know. to say as far as copaganda goes, Carl Winslow really did come home with a good attitude for somebody who was on the Chicago Co- PD. <laughs> Carl Winslow was Chicago PD. Yeah, he, and Urkel was his worst problem. No, the yeah. GDs down the street. <laughs> you worried about the wrong. Are these changes enough? It's what's happening. Is that enough or is there more that needs to happen? And if so, what else can we do? Or do we just wait and see? Do we just blacken up these writers rooms, blacken up these diversity panels and consulting, hire black consultants and see where that gets us in a couple of years? Or are there more drastic things that you all would like to see happen in the in the short term? I think it's not enough, but I I don't think it's enough. I think we are skimming the surface of how we are truthfully telling the the nation's 
um, the, the, the relationship we have, the America has with the police. I don't think there's any story out there that's actually actively portraying how current modern day America, America's relationship with the police. That now that being said, that doesn't mean to go on the other uh, opposite end and just be like, all cops are big to, you know, have a show called a cab and then just, uh, you know, just show the negativity, uh, and only show just the worst, the worseness of cops. Cause that's not the case either, but we have to find a way to tell the true story of policing in America. I know it's entertainment. I know it's TV. I know it's entertainment, but for the past like 30 years, it, it was it maybe longer than that it has not told the real story and it's had a negative consequence consequence on many Americans. Madeline, what stories surrounding policing and our criminal justice system would you like to see told? I mean, I agree with Ashton. I think that we haven't really seen a real, like a real portrayal. So I do think showing that, I also think there, I mean, there, there just needs to be more space for other stories that doesn't like that don't only tie black people to policing as well, right? Like we can't only have stories of tragedy you know, I think like showing the full spectrum of humanity, which is often not shown on police proce procedurals, like you just need space for like other shows as well. Um, but again, a lot of that change happens like, you know, in the writer's room. I mean, I guess, I mean, I'm kind of curious now, like, cause you're both actors, like, would you want to be, would you be in a police procedural? Like, would you take a role as a cop or oh, a detective? Like me if I want to play a slave. Uh, no, 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 I just, I'm just, cause of just like how, me. like, I guess that's like, if it was changed. I, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't, I think it has to change mm, a lot, but I don't know exactly how. Well, I had a sitcom that was originally in development here at Comedy Central where I played a probation officer. And for me, I wanted to show the redemption side of the criminal justice system because I feel like that's something that we don't see enough of. Most shows that involve the criminal, the legal system, it's either the cop, it's the case, or it's jail. Mm -hmm. But there's never anything on the other side of that. I would say the only show in the last couple of years to even come close to that is The Last OG on TBS. Mm -hmm. And that's really more of the first two seasons where we see Tracy Morgan's character going to a halfway house. Mm -hmm. And that's really not about the criminal justice system as much as that show is more about one man's journey back from all of that it's not really peeling back the layers of probation and the bullshit mm -hmm. and everything you go through and keep this job, but you got a job, but the job is out of your travel district and the judge won't give you clearance to go to the next County to work. So now you're in violation because you're two payments behind on your restitution. Like they don't really get into that on the last OG, but that's definitely, you know, that's definitely been a show that I've enjoyed seeing kind of explore just a different part of that world they do that in atlanta there's like scenes of in atlanta in in the in the tv show atlanta earn or um childish gambino's character he gets arrested and you keep in throughout the season you see him still having to go to probation office he calls out oh wow i have oh uh, if i don't pay i'm going to jail and people i don't think a lot of americans recognize that when you get arrested, no, it's, I mean, specifically, especially for something as in, inconsequential as marijuana, there's millions of Americans dealing with have been put in a system where they their their life is now a Jenga, uh, a Jenga table. And one false move can have that entire uh, thing come crumbling down. And that's that's the situation you're put in. You're put in a situation where your future is literally at jeopardy and that pressure you feel it's not just dealing with police brutality the brutality continues after you get after you come out of jail and trying to get a job trying to vote trying to change laws there's so many things that you still have to deal with and the pressure is constantly on you so, so yeah, yeah i, I want to like i want to see more stories like ashton's story because like you were saying it's very like what you're saying is like i've you grew up around a lot of people who had very similar experiences with, like you but yet that's not really reflected like the truth of that is not reflected in on on screen. So those are the stories yeah. that absolutely need telling. Ashton's just an innocent kid. Yeah, Ashton's an innocent kid minding his business, but he knows the guy that sold the drugs that OD'd the girl. And Detective Vic Mackey pulls up, <laughs> takes Ashton, and, and chokes Ashton's him like, up. And I'm puts not a drug dealer, I'm a wall. prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah? You're not a drug dealer right now. <laughs> yeah. But if I take this crack cocaine and put it in your pocket, that's 10 years. <laughs> Where's T Bake? 
<laughs> Tell me where T Bake is. I ain't telling you shit, copper. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the time we have for today. I'm pretty sure we fixed Copaganda. Special thanks to you, Madeline, and special thanks to you, Ashton, uh, for going beyond the scenes with me today. Hopefully, we've taken you beyond the scenes. Take care, everybody. Um, I'm going to go rewatch The Shield now. I'm sorry. It's a good show. <laughs> I, think, I think I am too, honestly. Yeah, I think I'm a huge fan now. Yeah. Everybody go watch The Shield. Uh, yeah. I think that's the. <laughs> he went on a date with uh, Forrest. Look, I know the music is playing. I know I'm supposed to shut up now. I don't care. Forrest Whitaker was internal affairs and was investigating Vic Mackey. Vic Mackey went on a date with his ex wife just to break him down. Yeah. <laughs> Whole world. That's a dirty cop. Spoiling it. That's a dirty Dirty cop. (laughs) That's a dirty (laughs) cop. He dirty macking and dirty copping. Dead. Yo. Oh. Yo. We'll see y'all next week.